There are some families whose histories and connections are inextricably woven into the fabric of finance and business. Only a few perpetuate this across generations, each with a different tilt and emphasis. One such family with a distinguished pedigree and long history are the Goldsmiths. And today, in what I hope will be a wide-ranging conversation from finance to the environment and charity, I'm delighted to welcome Ben Goldsmith, financier and environmentalist. Ben, welcome to the Money Miss podcast. Thank you for having me, Simon. So as they say, you can run, but you can't hide. And my wife, Katie, as she was then, Katie Porter, was teaching you when you were eaten, and she said you were especially mischievous. Would that be a fair characterization? I think I was quite quite badly behaved at school. I mean, I did all right <laughs> academically, um, but I, I didn't do much sport, so I had a lot of free time on my hands and um, tended to use it badly. Um, everyone, of course, was in love with your wife at the time. Every single boy in that school um, um, was in love with her. <laughs> well, that's a whole different conversation and podcast. But like your father, you eschewed university. Was that because actually you hated study? No, I, I was quite academic. I was in the Oxbridge stream at Eton, and I would have gone to university. But my father was one of those post-war entrepreneurs who didn't go to university, went straight to work, and left school at 16. And, and he was unwell, and, and as it turned out, dying when I was 15. And he said to me, I, I really don't think you should go to university. You know, unless, unless you know what you want to be, you want to be an architect or a surgeon, you know, don't go, go straight to work. You'll learn much more um, in, in the real world. And, and then he died. So I, I, I did what he had suggested. And I think if he'd lived, I probably would have gone to university. And when you're born as you were into a, an illustrious family full of history, is it all gift or is there some burden? I mean, I'm not sure I was fully aware. My, my father was not that present in our lives. He was a sort of very loving and warm and charismatic kind of whirlwind that would appear for a week here and a week there, and join us on the odd holiday. But really, I grew up quite in quite a suburban setting in Richmond, went to a local day school before going on to Eton. And my mother had um, you know, quite a kind of cozy, stable, sort of familial setup for us all. So I, I, I'm not sure I really would have thought that I was growing up any part of any kind of dynasty um, in, in, in my youth. And, and how did you earn your first pound or dollar? So I, I left school and I traveled for a bit. My, my sister had been married for a few years to Imran Khan and, and had been living in Pakistan, this kind of exotic, strange existence in first Lahore and then Islamabad. And I'd already visited her there once. And I went for three months and, and traveled in, with a friend in the Himalayas. Um, and, um, and, and on to Nepal and other places, and, and then came back and got a job at Hargreave Hale, which is a private client stockbroker, which, which is now part of Can Accord Genuity. And in fact, my first boss, Dan Marks, who's only a few years older than me, was seven or eight years older than me, is, is, is my stockbroker still today. Um, and I was there for quite a good time because I was there at, at the kind of peaking of the dot-com bubble and then the subsequent bursting of that bubble. I mean, I was sort of dishing out within two, three months of being there, I was kind of dishing out stock tips to kind of punters who called the line. I don't think I was supposed to do that. And <laughs> what when shares were kind of tripling in a day. Um, I, I got my mother to buy one thing called High Point Telecommunications, which had been tipped by Jim Slater in one of the investment magazines. And um, I mean, within about six weeks or eight weeks of her buying it, you, you, you wouldn't have been able to buy a plane ticket to Malaga with, with, with what was left. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was an extraordinary period. Well, we're going to talk about investing, but we're hopefully going to also talk about your passion for addressing environmental issues and, and, and talk about progress there. We're going to talk about managing a UK-listed investment trust, advising the government on agricultural matters, and the whole theme of rewilding. But let's just pause on the investing piece, because you uh, were the co-founder, and, and you are the CEO of Manhattan Capital, London Listed Investment Trust, but it had a, a little bit of a history in environmental activities, which which then created a spin-off in private equity. So could you just put the jigsaw together for me? So, so I left Hargreave Hale to, to set up an investment management firm called Web. It was previously a little corporate finance boutique, Wiley Hayworth Environment Business. And I persuaded Mr. Wiley and Mr. Hayworth that we should turn their business into a climate and sustainability themed investment management boutique. And we began with a venture capital team. And then later we added a listed equities team. And that's what I spent um, a little over a decade doing. Today, Web Asset Management runs a listed equity strategy only, having spun out the venture capital business a few years ago. Um, and they run approximately a billion point five in sterling and they're growing fast. And they're one of London's 
um, more highly respected sustainability themed investment management firms. Um, so that's what I did for a period of time. I, I had it in mind to build a kind of green Blackstone you know, with a bunch of different platforms, infrastructure, venture capital, uh, listed equities. And for a while, that, that prize seemed a possibility. But in the end, we... Um, um, in the in the end, we spun out the venture business and we 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 folded the infrastructure business and web asset management today just invests in listed securities. Um, I, I stepped back from web in 2014 to launch an investment trust. And and what I liked about the investment trust structure is that if you have permanent capital, because these are closed ended vehicles, they're listed, um, then you're able to take a much longer view. You can invest in private equity, private credit. Uh, you can get involved in more esoteric deals of the kind that my family group have been doing for a long time. Um, and, and, and I guess at a higher level, you can flex the mix of asset classes according to how you see the world, which is really hard to do in an open-ended structure where investors could theoretically withdraw their money um, at any given moment. So I, I teamed up with Graham Thomas, who'd been for a number of years um, effectively chief executive of RIT, which is Lord Rothschild's vehicle. Um, and we wanted to emulate the best characteristics of RIT. Um, and we listed in, in 2015, we raised 80 million pounds. We had a bit of a rocky start, let's say, and we didn't quite know what we were. Are we a hedge fund? Are we, you know, we, we got involved in sort of binary outcome situations, distressed credit. Abengoa was a big renewables developer in Spain, which went kaput. And long and the short, we, we were down a bit in the first year, um, quite a lot, in fact, 22% at one stage. Um, and then we we built the team and, and we decided that we would take the kind of conventional sort of Buffett school long term approach to investing, applying it to this theme of of sustainability and and what I what I the term I use is the green industrial revolution. So in other words, quality and value. We don't do venture. We don't do distressed credit. We don't do anything hedge fundy or or, or kind of binary in nature. We're pretty conservative and it's worked really well. We've we've compounded at around ten percent net of costs for seven years now on average, which makes us the second or third best performing investment trust of any kind in London um, during that period. So it's working out. And this perennial problem of the discount on these investment trusts, whilst you're long term, how do you think about that? How do you how do you day to day, you know, manage what is a frustration when these these trusts go to decent discounts? I mean, it helps that that, that we control it to some degree. Um, we, we own um, a little under a third of the equity. That's that's me and my partners and our respective families. Um, but but it's an issue, of course. Um, the the performance has been really good. Our net assets, um, in 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 terms of um, a number per share, is around 140 pence today. The share price is 95 pence. And if you look at the underlying investments, they're mostly large cap, high quality. Um, publicly traded companies, companies that we know will be around in five, 10 years time, companies which have really strong competitive positioning and kind of monopolistic characteristics, Alphabet, Microsoft, and we've got um, some of the North American freight railroad uh, regional monopolies, kind of Canadian Pacific, Canadian National, Union Pacific. So it's it's quite safe stuff and it's quite conventional stuff. So the discount is is anomalous. And we did have more in the way of private positions, but again, they were all infrastructure backed, cash generative, kind of blue chip co-investments with firms like KKR and Apollo. Um, so I, I think the issue is size. You know, we're, we're, we're beneath 100 million in market cap, and that's an issue for some retail investment managers and so on. Um, and I think if we can just compound at the same sort of rate for a period of time, we'll grow and we'll eventually we'll eventually reach a scale at which the discount starts to uh, reduce. I mean. RIT began life small and at a discount. Same with Caledonia, which is backed by the Kayser family. Um, Hansa Trust still trades at a big discount. That's a Salomon family. Um, so it's a kind of, it's a green one of those is that I'm trying to build. And, and it's a long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. No, and uh, for long-term investors, I've scoured the universe of investment trusts in previously. It can, particularly when there's concern, create you know, quite a lot of opportunity. Two questions just before we leave the fund. You chose as your benchmark RPI plus 3%. Fine when when inflation was quiescent. When it's not, it becomes more tricky. Just how, what was your thinking behind the benchmark? So we used to use the MSCI. Um, I mean, one reason is that we didn't want to have to pay an extortionate fee to benchmark ourselves against the MSCI. But, 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 but a bigger reason is that I don't think it was an accurate benchmark because We've had as much as 40% of the portfolio in private deals. Um, and those are typically 
real asset deals, either infrastructure or real estate that produce a certain amount of yield and and, and that which have some sort of upside story to them. And um, I think what our shareholders want is to preserve an increased purchasing power. So we thought inflation plus three is, 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 is as good as any other benchmark. And when I saw that 15% was in two Canadian railways, which you mentioned, and, and I, we're going to come on in a minute to Chris Hone, who's been a guest on the show, who also owns them. Just what's the what's the two sentence line on the railways as an, wearing your investment cap? So from an, an investment perspective, we like those railways because they have a very strong competitive positioning. It's virtually impossible to build a new railway, um, and um, therefore they have pricing power. In an inflationary environment, that's extremely important. The, the other thing we like is that moving stuff around by rail is about 90% more efficient in terms of use of fuel and emissions than, than by truck. So most companies are now looking to move stuff around by rail more and more. Um, and uh, we, we like the fact that these, these franchises have networks that cross North America. It's actually better and, and often more convenient and cheaper to bring goods in from Asia, for example, by ship into Canadian ports and then bring them down through the rail network into the US. Um, so it's it's really um, it's a part of our capital preservation strategy. We think these are pretty safe bets. Environmental concerns, clearly they've been very important for you over the last couple of decades. Where did this environmental passion originate? So I grew up with a kind of profound fascination with and, and love for nature. Now, I grew up in suburban West London in Richmond, but actually there's a lot of nature there. If you think Richmond Park's so 3,000 odd acres, and then you've got two or 300 acres of common land woodland. And I, I grew up in a place that was absolutely teeming with life. And so I was obsessed with building ponds and putting up bird boxes and, and getting up very early in the morning to go out looking for kind of foxes and badgers. And that, that was what I was obsessed with. And um, that persisted, I, I, I guess, because some of the adult influences in my life had similar degrees of love for nature into adulthood. And I, I think sometimes children who love nature leave it behind in childhood to some degree. Um, I had Imran, for example, my uncle Teddy, my father, my brother Zach, who's right now minister for um, uh, environment and climate in the foreign office. And I think if you really love nature, you can't help but notice that it's terribly depleted, especially in this country. I mean, we used to visit an aunt in Dorset and she had a farm there. and. I remember going out there and, and, and being really shocked at how little nature there was as compared with suburban West London. I mean, there was sort of sheep and barbed wire and hedges kind of cut to the quick and maybe the odd crow. And the, you know, maybe I wasn't looking hard enough, but I used to think of the countryside as a place without much nature. And as it turns out, that that's accurate when it comes to this country. We're, if nature is wealth, we're in the poorest 3% of nations on earth. If you fly into Gatwick or London City and you see that great kind of patchwork quilt of green fields beneath you, it looks beautiful and it looks green, but it's lifeless in, in, in the modern era. It's silent. As you read eyewitness kind of statements of, of what, what kind of abundance existed in Britain 150, 200 years ago, you know, seas absolutely thronging with fish and you know, the skies above them you know, filled with seabirds, you know, the, 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 the volume of birdsong just in any kind of ordinary scene in, in rural England. It's, it's largely gone. Um, and so therefore, if you love nature and you realize this, you can't help but become an environmentalist. So we're going to come to the rewilding piece a little later, but one thing is understanding and feeling passionate. Another thing is creating a voice. How did you go about doing that? Well, in my investing life, um, the, the businesses that I established were focused on investing in a theme that's now become quite mainstream, which is the theme of transition to a world in which resources and energy, raw materials and so on are used far more efficiently um, in, in which emissions make their way down to zero. You know, that's kind of how I've expressed myself as an investor. Um, I, I, th I think we can overhype how much impact that has. Um, I, um, I think in venture capital, it definitely makes an impact if you're backing companies that have exciting new ideas that can change things dramatically. But owning Canadian Pacific rather than, a rather than a trucking company, I don't know how much impact that really has. It's more recent that I've become more actively involved in, in the kind of campaigning side of things you know, as, as a philanthropist and as an activist. And I found that um, we're really pushing at an open door nowadays. You know, people are yearning for change and they're yearning for the restoration of nature. There's a kind of growing understanding that, that we've really trashed nature um, way more than perhaps people realized earlier on. 
And there's, there was a clamor to put that right. So if we deal with this chronologically, in 2003, which is 20 years ago, you've co-founded the UK Environmental Funders Network, EFN. So just explain what you thought that could achieve. The idea of the Environmental Funders Network, which just celebrated its 20th anniversary, was to bring together the handful of philanthropists in the UK who support environmental work. At that time, there were very, very few. I mean, I think at first lunch, we had about 10 people. And um, at that time, about 2% of total philanthropic giving in this country is allocated to environment. That number's a bit bigger now, probably 4% now. Uh, but in, in volume terms, the number's grown dramatically. So today we have about 150, 160 participants in the Environmental Funders Network giving out, give or take, maybe maybe 300 million pounds a year to environmental work. Um, and, and the point of bringing them together in a forum is to get them to collaborate, to communicate, and just to be far more effective in their giving. Um, and I, I think I think we've done a really good job on on that front. And then in 2016, Sir Chris Hone, who, as I mentioned, was a fabulous guest, uh, you know, on you know on the show, appointed you as a trustee of CIF, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. And I wondered what he thought, what skill he thought you brought to the party. So he's he's um, as well as being probably the smartest hedge fund manager in, in you know, among the smartest hedge fund managers in the world. He is our biggest member in the Environmental Funders Network. So the Children's Investment Fund Foundation now gives out approximately half a billion dollars a year, much of that on climate globally, and the rest on the protection, the empowerment, the health and education of young girls and women in Africa and India. And um, it's an amazing organization. He's applied his brilliance as an investor to his philanthropic activities such that the money is spent so wisely, so strategically um, that, that, that a lot of the institutions in the kind of global climate movement were built by CIF. Things like C40, which brings together the world's largest cities in a kind of joint and collaborative effort to reduce emissions, um, whose president is now our own mayor here, Sadiq Khan. Um, there's a whole suite of initiatives like that that he's set up. Um, what, what did he want from me? Um, I guess he thinks I've sort of, you know, could, could, could be accretive to the strategic thinking of CIF in, in terms of how we give money out. I'm very active in, in the climate program um, of CIF, which is about half the budget. Um, and we've been friends a long time. Right, right. Then, two years later, you were appointed non-executive director at the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, otherwise known as DEFRA. And you just stepped down from there. I know you tell me you're on your way to number 10, which is why I might be asking these questions more quickly than I normally would. Um, but I had actually a question from an agritech investor and friend of the show called Jeff Colgrave, who said, you helped to steer ELMS, which is the Environmental Land Management System, through government. It replaces the CAP system that was, you know, much criticised. Um, uh, and one of its three planks is payments for rewilding, which is obviously close to your heart. And the question was, do you believe the ELMS program provides adequate financial support for farmers, given their input costs, especially fertilizers and fuels, have risen so dramatically? Or should the tilt, at least currently, f would be for more money to be sent on helping farmers get through this period? I think he's right that, that, that there's not enough money in the, in the program you know i think i think about 5 billion a year would be enough to solve most of our farming and nature problems you know, the the elm budget is going to be about half that i mean it's a lot of money but given what we want from the land in terms of food production amenity carbon sequestration clean water and so on and so forth um it do, it doesn't seem like a big expenditure on the part of the state um to top elms up a little bit and make sure farmers are properly rewarded for what they do um, that being said, I think it's the most exciting and important change that's happened um, ever in, 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 in terms of nature policy in this country and farming policy. Now, let's not forget the, the common agricultural policy dishes out 55 billion euros a year. It's about 60% of the total EU budget, which is kind of mind boggling in itself. And our share of that in England, because DEFRA is an English department for the most part, was somewhere around two and a half billion pounds. And the money was dished out according simply to how much land a farmer owns. That's all. Doesn't matter what you do with it, as long as it's farmable. So if you've got a kind of, you know, a, a patch of wet ground where the tractor always gets stuck and it's difficult to do anything with it, 
if you leave it and allow the kind of reed beds to return and the ducks to return and stuff, the eye in the sky will spot it under the old scheme and say, sorry, that's no longer farmable. It's full of ined- ineligible features being nature. And therefore, you don't get the subsidy anymore. So for that reason, every square inch of our country has been turned into farmland without um, uh, without any space left for kind of scrub or wetlands and so on. Um, because of the the incentive created by the common agricultural policy. And by the way, 50% of the money went to the richest 10% of landowners. So you'd never have designed that scheme from scratch. And those farming voices who think it should have been perpetuated post-Brexit are living in cloud cuckoo land because it would have eventually been scrapped. Now, how do you justify dishing out cash, you know, hard-earned taxpayers' cash to landowners with no strings attached? You know, it wouldn't have survived more than the parliament or two. The new scheme, the environmental land management scheme, dishes out cash to those landowners and farmers who can show that they're delivering public goods. In fact, it says on the face of the bill, public money for public goods. And those public goods mean the stewardship and restoration of soil, nature, the natural capital on which all farming and all food production ultimately depends. And I think they've been really smart in the way that they've siloed it. There's kind of three silos. The biggest and the broadest is called the Sustainable Farming Incentive, which is geared towards those farmers who are really producing food and feeding us. Now, 85% of the food in this country comes from just 20% of the land. So those farmers are feeding us, but often at the cost of one, two, three percent annual losses of our soil, the loss of pollinators, the pollution of watercourses, and the whole thing is a bit unsustainable. And so the new Sustainable Farm Incentive will reward them for moving towards regenerative practices while continuing to feed the nation. So what that means is um, precision application of inputs, chemical inputs. You know, chemical inputs are being abused at the moment. You know, if you get eczema on a patch of your elbow, you don't soak your entire body in steroid cream. You, know, you apply it to where the problem is. Well, drones and soil sensors and other modern technology can help us identify where to apply those things. You know, similarly, ancient practices such as rotations and so on, and no-till where you don't plow the soil and therefore reduce erosion. All of these things fall under the umbrella of regenerative farming. And I think that first silo of the environmental land management scheme will bring about a transformation in our productive farmed landscapes. The other two silos are more about nature. There's local nature recovery is the second one, which is about farms that look like farms, but it's about weaving nature back through them wildflower meadows, hedges, ponds, and so on, it may not be particularly productive, but the local nature recovery will make them viable if nature is woven back through their fabric. And the third pillar is rewilding. And that's in our remoter landscapes, places where food production is basically a joke at present and where nature has more or less disappeared. You know, our national parks are really dire. And if, any, if you've ever been to Dartmoor or Bodmin or the Pennines or the Lake District, these are our wild landscapes, except they're not wild at all. You'll find sheep and crows and not much else. So in those places, the third tier will stimulate and incentivize a much more nature-friendly approach. My wife is from Dartmoor. I can uh, verify that that description is correct. But before we leave governments, and we, I think in the West, expect too much of governments in the culture that's developed, and we have revolving doors on ministries, you're, you, you, you're suggesting some quite sensible strategic stuff has been done. What would you like to see in the next few years from governments of whichever persuasion we find ourselves with? I'd like to see more money in the environmental land management scheme, and I'd like to see ministers and officials hold their nerve on it, because the first big test is right now on Dartmoor. 200 million pounds of taxpayers' money has been dished out during the last 10 years on Dartmoor to farmers, ostensibly for restoring nature. Now, that's what Natural England's job is. They've given 200 million to farmers of your money and mine for restoring nature. And yet Dartmoor, which was in terrible shape 10 years ago, is in even worse shape today. Across almost every indicator, there's been continued decline. So Natural England under the new scheme is now saying, look, the same amount of money is available, but we really do need to see some nature recovery this time, which means far fewer sheep, but you can double the number of cattle you've got. You can still have lots of Dartmoor ponies, but it's got to be fewer sheep and no sheep out in the winter, in the winter on the moor, which is particularly harmful for nature. And there never used to be sheep on the moor in the winter. And farmers have gone mental on Dartmoor. Tory MPs have gone mental. There was a debate in Parliament two weeks ago. And there's a genuine danger that the government will backtrack on the whole thing. If if they succeed, these people, in strong-arming natural England into handing over vast amounts of taxpayers' money, effectively for sheep, inside one of our most important national parks, then it's a huge setback. So we really need ministers and officials to hold their nerve on the implementation of this environmental land management scheme. So rewilding, we've touched on it. We had 
Peter Harrison back on the show celebrating the three-year anniversary a couple of months ago. He talked about this being one of the great sort of less spoken about investment opportunities. In 2021, you established the Natagul, if I've got the pronunciation right, real estate company with Sir Charles Burrell and Pete Davis of Lansdowne, who again has been a sh- you know, on the show. Just tell us a little bit about what is the objective and how you've gone about putting this together. So I, I think rewilding as an idea is one of the most exciting things to happen in the world in recent years or decades. Now, this idea that we can restore ecosystems back to a degree of vibrancy that in many cases hasn't been seen for centuries, I think is just so appealing to people. And that's why millions of people engage with rewilding stories when they appear. You know, the reintroduction of white stalks to Sussex, you know, a little bit of tutting from kind of the usual voices, but in parallel, millions of people engaging with that story on the BBC. You know, last time white stalks bred in Britain was on Edinburgh Cathedral in about 1480 or 1490. And now they're wheeling above the skies of Southern England again. So that's, that's really totemic stuff. So I, I think, as, Atter- as David Atterman said, you know, we really do need to rewild the world you know, with a caveat, wherever it makes economic and ecological sense to do so. The convenient factor in this country, in Britain, is that one of the key natural processes in our ecosystem is the presence of grazing bovines, because they've always been here. Before there were humans here, you had wild bison, you had wild ox, and the grazing and browsing and trampling of these large bovines is 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 the key factor in creating the kind of mosaic, flower-rich, scrubby woodlands that would have once characterized great swathes of Britain, which means that we need the farmer because those wild bovines are no longer here. We don't have bison. We don't have wild ox. What we have are their domestic descendants, the kind of native longhorns and other horned cattle. So the beautiful proposition in our national parks f- is to provide these farmers who are the, the soul and the backbone of these communities with this alternative to sheep ranching, which is a relatively new phenomenon, 30, 40 million sheep in this country, it's not a native animal, to to transition away from that form of sheep ranching, which is so destructive, to a much gentler, more traditional way of farming with horned cattle, which effectively mimics how our ecosystems used to function. That's, That's what rewilding subsidies really mean to me, is persuading and incentivizing farmers to make that change back to how their ancestors farmed with horned cattle. If we do that in our national parks, we will have an extraordinary recovery of natural abundance. And I think that's inexorably where we're heading. Um, And I think in terms of um, what I've been doing with Pete Davis and Charlie Burrell, is that that proposition is, is arguably and now an investable proposition. And that's the bit I want to unpick because the high level restoration and enhancement is clear. The economic benefit and why it's going to, you know, why it creates a, an attractive investment proposition is less clear to me. We've started to understand in the world that nature, as well as being intrinsically priceless, as well as being intrinsically vital to, to humans, it also produces tangible economic value. So, for example, some towns in Britain flood almost every year. And the reason why they flood is because they're surrounded by hills that have been grazed to nothing by sheep. So when the rains fall, those hills simply lose the water straight down the catchment into people's living rooms. It costs the country a fortune every year. If you allow those hills to become cloaked once again with nature, you know, scrub and trees and wetlands and peatlands and so on, then when the rains come, the landscape acts like a sponge and holds that water back and releases it slowly through the year. The result is no flash flooding in the winter or certainly significantly reduced flash flooding. And similarly, no hose pipe bans in the summer because those sodden landscapes then leak slowly throughout the rest of the season. That has a real value, that mitigation of flooding and that mitigation of drought and regularization of the hydrological cycle. So the environment agency and local councils are now starting to pay landowners hard cash for changing the way they manage their land in order to sequester water in that way. The recreation of wetlands is a really good example. Similarly, the water companies are spending more and more money fishing nitrates out of the drinking water. It costs them a fortune. They have to build concrete infrastructure and plant to remove chemicals and nitrates and so on from the water. And they've started to realize that it's far cheaper 
to engage in a, what, what they call a nutrient neutrality process with landowners, where they manage the water, they measure the water as it enters someone's land and they measure it when it leaves their land. And if there is a neutrality of, of nutrients, or even better, if the water comes off their land with even less nutrients, then that saves them an enormous amount of money in CapEx downstream. So there are now 12 nutrient neutrality markets up and down the country, whereby companies such as Wessex Water are paying farmers to change the way they manage their land. So that's just two examples. Similarly, voluntary carbon. Mark Carney believes voluntary carbon will be a $100 billion a year market in two or three years' time. Voluntary biodiversity offsetting. The number of large companies that want to be nature positive is growing very, very fast. So there's a whole slew of markets now which exist for the purpose of paying for particular environmental outcomes that is derived from particular management um, strategies on the land. So if you buy a patch of sheep wrecked kind of hillside and you allow nature to recover on that land, there's a very good chance you'll be able to cash in on the voluntary carbon, voluntary biodiversity, flood mitigation, nutrient neutrality, and so on. So the buzzword in rural circles today is stacking. How do you stack these payments? Because farmers of all kinds, landowners of all kinds now have two revenue lines. They've got the revenue line from the sale of food and they've got the revenue line from the sale of environmental services. So if you're in the in the kind of productive, fertile flatlands of Cambridgeshire, food is obviously going to be your business. And you might make a little bit of money from some kind of environmental service on the side. But if you're in the kind of agriculturally marginal national parks of the kind of northwest or the southwest, then natural capital is likely to be your biggest revenue. And the government, by way of its environmental land management scheme, is effectively the biggest and the earliest buyer of all these services. Thank you. That's well explained and expressed, particularly for somebody like myself who has maybe struggled to get his arms around it. Let's talk about a little bit about uh, charity. You chair, I think, your family charity or one of the family charities. And, and one of the, I guess, issues when we've spoken to you know folks around the issue of philanthropy is the number of claims that are made and prioritizing them, um, which is you know, unenviable because somebody's always going to feel slightly aggrieved. How do you think about it and go about it practically? So in terms of restoring nature at scale, I think the topic we've just discussed is the most exciting one. The idea that we can create an asset class out of rewilding in the same way that growing trees and selling timber is an asset class or putting up buildings and providing student accommodation is an asset class that anyone can invest in. If we can make rewilding of ecosystems an asset class that produces a financial yield, then the scale at which we will be able to restore nature will be dramatically and exponentially increased versus what we can do with with philanthropy. And philanthropy's played a really important role in in kind of um you know keeping the wolf from the door. You know, in in I don't know if that was the best analogy because we want the wolf <laughs> to come through the door. But but um, if you see what I mean. Um, I, I think the most important role for philanthropy is in bringing about systemic change. You know, some of the most exciting things that have happened in the world have happened because of small groups of people on a shoestring budget who managed to create a systemic change. You know, Greenpeace and a coalition of organizations in the 70s literally saved the whales. You know, the last whales were being hunted down by ever larger, ever more complex uh, whaling ships. Those would have disappeared from the face of the earth had the small number of environment groups on a shoestring budget not brought about a civil society movement which demanded that governments stop whaling. And that's a really good example of how a small amount of philanthropy in the right hands can unlock massive cascading change. So that is what I think philanthropy is for. It's about funding um, smart, strategic, savvy, passionate people with an idea. And sometimes they'll succeed and sometimes they won't. Now, I can't let this moment go without letting everybody know that you've launched your own podcast. We don't want it to be a competing force with our own, but tell me a little bit about what you are trying to do. So I'm, I'm kind of, sli- I've always been a bit obsessive about these things. I mean, I won the star letter in age 14 or 15. I wrote to Country Life and I said, I thought their readers lacked imagination when it comes to the topic of wild boar. And that, of course, we should have wild. And they, you know, they sent me a pair of binoculars or some a coat. They sent me a coat. Um, and, and the 99-year-old Duke of Wellington wrote a letter into the next magazine, say, referring to letter Ben Goldsmith, previous issue. If any wild boar show up at Stratfield, say, they'll be shot by my keepers. And um, But I've been somewhat obsessed about rewilding in nature all my life. And, and that means scrolling the internet and searching for stories of optimism and restoration. And often it's really hard to find anything about 
some of the most exciting rewilding projects that are happening in the world. I mean, who, who in this room has heard of the American Prairie Reserve? You know, a 3.2 million acre restoration project in Northern Montana, you know, Native American communities, national parks, private lands being woven together, you know, huge herds of bison. This is bigger than Yellowstone. You have to go into kind of regional kind of press from Montana to find anything about it. So the idea of this new podcast is to bring these stories to the attention of listeners. And I've interviewed so far 12 people who are leading some of the most extraordinary rewilding projects from around the world. The podcast is called? Rewilding the World with Ben Goldsmith. Right. We will feature it on our show notes, et cetera, to give that, you uh, a little uh, little more coverage. That would be very kind. Um, I've got some general closing questions, not related to rewilding necessarily. What's your most important daily habit? I think to walk across Primrose Hill with... Um, two of my younger children to their school. I think we go, my wife and I and the two children walk across the hill, put them in school, have a coffee, and then go off our separate directions. I think starting the day with a little walk outside in nature makes you feel good. So, um, you know, Ben, just before you were here, which is why we're a little late starting, we had Jason Watkins, the actor who had the tragedy of losing his young daughter to sepsis, and he's very involved in child bereavement. We uh, had Justin Barham Shaw on the show, whose son Felix, of course, tragically died. And the Felix Project has, you know, has, has transformed food recycling, you know, in London. You suffered an appalling, you know, loss of your daughter. And I wondered, for anybody, you know, dealing with such devastation, is there any advice you'd offer? God, it's very hard. Um, I mean, I think in the early days, you just need to make sure you don't forget the basics. You know, make sure you eat, make sure you sleep. And if you do feel a little ray of sunshine, through the clouds, you know, in, it, for example, enjoying a cup of tea or finding something funny, then you need to grab it with both hands and allow yourself to grab it with both hands. And, and, and what you'll find is that they come more often and that life and joy do return if you'll allow them to. Um, in, in my case, the, the light that penetrated the darkness was really a love of nature. And I realized that a lifelong love of nature was what would carry me through. And, and, and my kind of obsessional interest in, in, in restoring nature, restoring missing species, bringing beavers back to Britain, you know, reading about the American Prairie Reserve. You know, these things gave me a kind of a sense of hope and, and optimism and in time joy. And, and now I devote a big chunk of my life to this. What two things would you like to achieve in the next decade that would allow you to give yourself a pat on the back? So I uh, pat on the back. <laughs> I think I want, um, I'd like Charlie Burrell and Pete Davis and me to raise a billion dollars and have rewilding projects you know, all, over, um, all over Europe. Um, that would give me enormous joy. And I'd like to be responsible for the restoration of beavers, European beavers to every river system in Europe from which they've been extirpated. So I'm involved in projects in in Spain, Italy, Greece, soon Georgia, Azerbaijan, and we're even investigating whether beavers were present in Manchuria and, and, and Northeast China. And if they were, then um, the IUCN and I will do a project on that. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in beavers. I can't believe we got through a whole podcast without talking about <laughs> the, the, the importance of beavers as our, as our best tool for restoring life to our landscapes. So I can't allow you to go without this question. It's not a trick question. We have lots of guests from overseas who come through London. You know London very well. You have to recommend your favourite place to eat and dance in London. Where would it be? So to eat, I love a Chinese restaurant, a Sichuan Chinese restaurant called Minjiang, which is on the top floor of the Royal Garden Hotel in Kensington High Street with an amazing view across Kensington Gardens and Kensington Palace. And it really is delicious. So I go there um, to dance. Um, well, I'd probably say, say my brother, out of, out of loyalty and love, my brother Robin Burley's club, Lulu's, at the center of Shepherd's Market is quite fun. And you don't feel too old there. I mean, I, someone said it's where Middle East meets Middle Age. <laughs> <laughs> that must be why I feel quite comfortable there. Although I think we're a defining Middle Age, or at least I am. And actually, I think that Minjang, you have to order a special type of duck in advance, don't you? Which is their speciality. I'm going there tonight with my 91-year-old aunt and my 89-year-old mother and, uh, and, and one of my nephews and my wife. And I have pre-ordered a half a Beijing duck. Wow. Okay, well, there you go. So finally, na naming after that book, if you could tell us just one thing for the audience, piece of advice, what might it be? 
I think if I could tell myself one thing 20 years ago, it's to trust your gut. And I know that sounds cliche, but I don't think you can really learn it by being told it. I think you have to live the experience of not trusting your gut and then the experience of actually trusting you know, what your instincts have to tell you. Now, I think, um, I think quietening your mind um, um, at, at certain moments and allowing a kind of deeper self to express itself, I think is a really important thing. And I think there is a, a kind of wellspring of, of, of wisdom and empathy within us that a lot of people don't pay much attention to. So I think that's the thing that I would advise people, trust your instincts. Interestingly, we interviewed the chairman of De Beers only a few days ago, and that was exactly his advice. So, so there you go. So Ben, I am going to let you go. You have given us very different insights today on the Money Miss podcast. We've not talked about this whole area. You are fantastically passionate, but you are active and actioning and making a change. This whole rewilding uh, and the investment opportunities that are coming with it, I don't think are well appreciated. So I think you being a spokesperson, mouthpiece activist, you know, and, and bringing together this and finance is absolutely, you know, essential. And these environmental services, which can be monetized, is something that we're going to talk some more about on the show as well. So I'm going to let you go to your meeting with government. And thank you so much for joining the Money News podcast today. Thank you so much for having me, Simon.